It's Tuesday, May 30th. You can't tell, but I'm refusing to hold Wendell's hand right now. <laughs> uh, Trouble in paradise. <laughs> It's the last day of May. It's the beginning of June, which is the beginning of the new fiscal year for a lot of companies. So there's going to be an insane amount of news coming out of everything. I don't know what's happening. I'm actually in Taipei right now. You're watching this in the future or the present or in the past. Although if it's in the past, then I'm not in Taipei anymore. But as of the filming of this video, I'm in Taipei. Well, no, actually the video is No, the filming, before. you're here. I don't know. We're so awkward. We're so awkward. By the time you guys are watching this, I'm in Taipei. And that's for Computex. And so I would say that for the most up-to-date Computex news, you probably should check out my Twitter. There's a link in the description. It's uh, uh, twitter.com slash T-E-K Wendell. So eh, it's whatever. Somebody sent me the credentials to twitter.com slash Wendell once, but I, I think that that might have come from like one of the info dumps on Twitter, so I didn't do anything with that. But if somebody wants to send that again, since nobody's used that account, it's probably all right. Big thanks to MSI uh, for sending me and Fractal Design. So... Going to be some videos from that, going to be some pre-rolls, but it'll take us a little while to get the videos put together. Uh, there's a link in the description if you want to check it out and like and click on it a whole bunch and stuff. That that would be good. So, on with the news. Well, it's another week, and there's a lot of people that still want to cry about the security vulnerabilities. This time it's coming to Linux. <laughs> yeah. It's unusual that we start with a security story about Linux. This one is a variant of WannaCry, or I guess a successor is more accurate. And this one targets the Samba Linux subsystem. So if you're running, the actually the, the ones that this is targeting cannot be updated. Yeah. So if you're running one of those older distributions, you're in trouble. Yeah, this is uh, interesting for two reasons, not because of the security vulnerability, but the actual documentation from the Samba team says these routines are designed for debugging um, IPC permissions issues and things like that in the NT protocol. And you should always leave them enabled. Don't worry about it, it's cool. And that seems like a glaring oversight from the Samba team. And I'm not sure if that's just from the protocol or, or what. But yeah, there's not really a fix. Like you don't really need these things, but it's on by default and it lets you take over the machine that you're connecting to. So, you know, uh, this software is used in a lot of NAS devices, a lot of network attached stores that are running open source things other than Windows. So it's like, oh, I'm cool. I'm not running that on any of my computers. And you've got a NAS, don't be so sure. In other news, a follow-up to our story last week about Theresa May wanting to take over the internet. Well, we can't, you know, don't let a disaster uh, and terrible situation like the uh, terrorist bombing go to waste. Yeah, her response to, you know, are you going to use this terrorist attack to push these things down people's throats was, can confirm. <laughs> she has said that, uh, that there's a specific name for, like, the Control Act, or scroll down a little bit. It's, uh... Technical capability orders. So oh, that sounds really official, doesn't it? Yeah, that's part of the Snoopers charter. Yeah, technical capability orders means that any encryption at the ISP level is not allowed. And I think it's also true for like companies, so like Facebook, Apple, whatever. Yeah. Any kind of communications must be given a backdoor so the government and the alphabet agencies can go in there and look at it whenever they want. And it's expected that because of the terrorist attack, she will push for this almost immediately after being elected, if she is elected. Now, I think it's worth pointing out that the terrorists, there's no evidence that they were using um, encryption. Right. There's no evidence that they were using any of the messaging services. There's no evidence of, of any of that. That may come out in the wash. I mean, you know, it's like, oh, they were using Snapchat. Okay, I, I guess like half the planet uses Snapchat at this point. But the technologists are saying, oh, I hate that word. <laughs> um, they're saying that... Uh, you know, this, this sort of encryption weakness is bad because if the encryption weakness is there, it can be exploited by anyone. And the events of the last couple of years have shown that the bad guys are not just, you know, poor criminals working at the bottom of society. They're also nation states. So opening this up for, you know, the London police force or whatever uh, is also going to open it up for China and Russia and North Korea and other hostile states. And so... The people that are in the know with the technology are saying, hey, do you realize this is going to happen? And all I see from the opposition is a lot of hand-waving and gum-flapping about how something, something terrorists. There's not a logical argument to address this. It's all, it, none of it makes any logical sense. There's not actually an argument. I mean, 
if you were to take what Theresa May is saying to its logical conclusion, it would be like as if Facebook, uh, it would be like as if Facebook is in support of terrorists. So it's like we don't want to we don't want to change our encryption because we like terrorists is, you know, the logical conclusion of her argument, which is clearly absurd. But you're also that's even that argument is naive because we've also seen that the good guys <laughs> will abuse the shit out of these powers. <laughs> Whatever they can do, they will. And they, they won't stop there. They'll go even further. So if you give them keys to everything, of course, they're going to use it and they're going to use it constantly. So. <laughs> This is a really terrible thing. You mean like how Vermont is using its DMV photos for facial recognition, even though there's a law <laughs> explicitly prohibiting that? So, yeah, this is a law, and it's just in the state of Vermont. <laughs> I wonder if our state has that. I kind of doubt it. It would be fun to go and look and see which states don't allow this. But actually, this isn't just in Vermont. Any place that has a database, a biometric database, the cops love it. They're like, yeah, let's get in there. So what Vermont was doing was if there was a crime that somebody decided was really bad, it's like, we really need to catch this guy. They would just tell the cops, hey, send us a picture over. We'll match it up with our facial recognition database. See if we've got them. We'll tell you where they live. Well, it turns out that's illegal. Yeah, it turns out. It's like, oh, people didn't sign up for this. People did not okay this use of their data. It doesn't matter. They're going to do it anyway. And there's not going to be any repercussions for this. Nobody's going to get fired. Nobody's going to jail. No. That's, the information was in a database. It is, oh, was that wrong? Should we not have done that? And the ACLU has sued them, which I'm sure they're actually even going to fight that. You know, they're not even, it's like, oh, there's a law. Well, you know, this is for the good, though. We're doing good things. <laughs> These are bad people. So, yeah, if you live in Vermont and you get your license renewed, just know that if you do something bad, they're going to track you down like that. I have reason to believe that some of our audience may be filthy media pirates. <laughs> I also have reason to believe that some of them might watch anime with subtitles <laughs> based on your youtube avatars not that we're condoning what you're doing but here's a friendly warning about what you download <laughs> you need to update your media players because there are malicious subtitles of spreading viruses this is a really interesting attack vector yeah so in vlc and cody and popcorn time i think most of them have been patched the latest versions should protect you from this but still be aware of the source of your subtitles because the subtitles can actually take full control of your system. It's amazing. <laughs> this is not good. Like, <laughs> I mean, why was it written like yeah, this? So, why would the subtitle engine need that much permission? It's crazy. Uh, uh, so now you know. Go update your software. It'll be fine. You can hit pause. We'll wait on you. It's cool. Remember when Wikipedia sued the NSA? Or Wikimedia, I should say, which is Wikipedia's parent company, Parent Foundation? And the, when they sued them a couple of years ago, the court ruled that uh, they didn't have standing because they couldn't prove that they were spied upon. Well, they've been diligently working at proving that they were spied upon, uh, and they have shown that they have uh, spied on possible routes that the Wikimedia Foundation's traffic has taken and that Wikimedia Foundation has changed the way that they communicate as a result of having been spied upon. So they do have standing to sue on First and Fifth Amendment violations. The problem is... The Wikimedia Foundation still has to prove that they were spied upon. All that's happened here is the judges said this can go forward <laughs> because it seems the fact that they were spying on everything and you doing something falls within the bucket of everything. Yes, I think you can sue them over this, <laughs> but they do have to prove some specific example, I think, to have success with this lawsuit. I think it's a big uphill battle for them, but hey, they're fighting the good fight. So you'll hear about more of this as it develops from us. It's gonna be interesting to follow. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and predict now that there's gonna be some really amazing mental gymnastics <laughs> to avoid having to deal with this either on a technicality. And if this thing actually does get some teeth, I fully expect the people involved to be disappeared, which sounds really cynical because it is. They'll probably shoot themselves in the back of the head twice. <laughs> After falling down an elevator shaft. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Google Ads, do they work? Don't they work? How would you know? Well, one way to know would be to capture everybody's spending data and then tie that back to ads. That sounds really invasive. Yeah, so it's no secret that you have an advertising profile that kind of follows you around. Uh, some people don't know about it, and it is crazy how much they know. <laughs> and so, you know, the car dealership buys it from the grocery store, who sells it to the hospital, and it just keeps like a snowball. It just keeps growing. <laughs> Well, Google has built some software to tie all that together. 
Yeah. And, and it's gotten so good that they're actually to the point where it's like, okay, you advertised your bobble to Jim on Thursday. And on Saturday, Jim spent the exact amount of money that your bobble costs at Costco. We think that was successful. We're going to call that a successful sell. Your ad was successful. <laughs> Now, the most eye-opening thing in this is apparently Google already has insight into 70% of Americans' credit card transactions nationwide, meaning that Google gets a copy of your credit card statement right now, today, for data analytics. And it makes sense. Most advertisers probably would want to share that data with Google because they're probably paying uh, Google for um, advertising services. This is deeply disturbing on a whole bunch of levels. You also have to think that a lot of these places you're doing business with are using Google for advertising. So it's a vicious circle, you know? It's like <laughs> they actually can log into Google and they have an interface now where they set all this stuff up. So they're feeding Google, Google's feeding them, and you are the product. You're like the dog food that's being <laughs> consumed there. There, is, there are a couple products, like as a result of reading the story and doing the research on it, there are a couple products that I would like to see level one review that have to do with anonymizing credit card transactions and telephone numbers and things like that. Like there are services you can sign up for that will give you one-time use credit card numbers and will give you disposable cell phone numbers. Um, so that might be interesting for an upcoming review or test or you know dry run or whatever for level one because it sounds like that's gonna be just basic precautions. Because if Google can, like even if you trust Google, even if you don't mind Google having an advertising profile on you because you can more effectively buy things or get a better deal or whatever, criminals are going to have it too. And it becomes a problem for identity theft and impersonation um, or even just, you know, trying to make a big deal out of somebody's purchasing history. Is the title for that video about anonymizing credit cards and phone numbers going to be how to score higher on the terror watch list? Because <laughs> that's what's going to happen. <laughs> Why do I get detained every single time I fly? <laughs> Jesus. Oh, this is just... <sighs> In banking news this week, hackers have hit Russian bank customers, and uh, they've they sort of planned international raids. So they used Android, and basically it was kind of like a phishing attack. You download a bad app, and they capture all your credentials and stuff like this. They used SMS banking mm -hmm. that is popular in Russia, and they were able to you know, get in between the customer and the bank and actually steal all those transactions. They were planning to go to France with it. And they all got busted and arrested. Uh, we, we assume it was all of them. <laughs> These guys actually, uh, they weren't hackers, so to speak. They were actually buying. You know, we talked about uh, Shadow Brokers is doing a subscription service. They were on a subscription plan <laughs> for malware. And they were just, yeah, hey, this month, well, we got some good malware this month. Let's use it. And they used it to steal a bunch of money. Yeah, the story here is not that they were really using super sophisticated software or this was, you know, a super organized, you know, gang of cyberpunks. You know, imagine whatever, like cyber den of iniquity from whatever anime no this is just some dudes downloading some android software sending good old-fashioned emails it's like hey bob yeah it's sam uh you need to install this android app so okay sounds good this there's nothing sophisticated going on here that they got as far as they did shows how bad the infrastructure is to begin with yeah you get the impression that the reason they got caught is because they didn't know what the hell they were doing. They were just like, they didn't know the precautions to take. They were basically just in your face, just stealing your money. And as soon as somebody who knew what was going on here looked at it, they were like, oh, just go pick them up. They're here. But it shows you how easy it is if you trust anything to get to, to be a victim of this kind of thing. So clearly you should use your fingerprint and iris recognition on your phone to protect <laughs> against that kind of thing, right? Neither, nope. neither of those can possibly be counterfeited. <laughs> Here's a hack for the uh, iris detection on the Galaxy S8. You can literally print out a picture of somebody's eyeball and put a contact lens over it and get in. Well, you have to use night mode on your camera <laughs> for the picture to have the, the right kind of resolution and the texturing for it to work. But yeah, basically, I don't, I don't know if they use the camera on the S8. That would be ironic, <laughs> wouldn't it? But a nice phone camera, night mode, and slap a contact lens on there, it gets you right in. <laughs> this was for another important thing. This was from a medium distance. Yeah. So you didn't have to put it like right in their face. You could catch a photo of them, probably that they don't even know is happening, and get into their phone. It's iris detection. It's fine. Nope. Not good. And a lot of the time, you know, with those kinds of banking transactions, it actually is worse than people realize because the bank logs those transactions. And so, like, if you initiate a wire transfer or something like that, and the banking application does do iris or fingerprint, um, 
the bank sort of says, no, it's on you to prove this is fraudulent. So you can inadvertently put yourself in a more difficult position to recover those funds or to have insurance pay out on a recovery on those funds. Also, fun fact, when you do stock trades or bank transactions or whatever on your phone, it's taking a picture of you yeah. because it's making sure it's you. So if you do your banking on the toilet, just keep in mind, somebody's taking a picture of you. <laughs> You guys own drones? You own a DJI drone? You know, they're sort of one of the big names in the industry. Uh, they've really made headlines this week because they've threatened to brick their uh, copters unless the owners agree <laughs> to register their copters through the app. Well, now, of course, you know, we readily admit sometimes to these stories don't have quote unquote good sources. <laughs> this is the sun. They're not threatening to brick anything. That is a, <laughs> that's a clickbait headline. But what they are threatening to do is to limit it to so every nation and you know municipality they have different rules about drones and the reason they want to make you register is because they want to make sure that your drone is locked into the rules of your area so in, the brick here is that they will actually limit it to the most restrictive drone rules anywhere in the world which is like i, I don't know it's like just a few meters that you can yeah. fly can't use a camera yeah. can't use anything else and so it, the, it still will function, but you won't have much fun with it. Now, it's fun because in America, and I want to say that in, in parts of Europe, too, went through the same process with the Internet. And it was like uh, content on the Internet, you know, what is decent and what is not decent content. And so the reasoning in those cases sound an awful lot like the, the reasoning from DJI because it was, well, look, if we, if we go down this rabbit hole of whatever the most restrictive you know, community guidelines for content on the Internet is, then the Internet would only have the most restricted vanilla content that you can possibly have. So this is a little different than speech. This is operating a drone. But I have to wonder about their motivation to, to do this. It just doesn't, I mean, it's like, oh, we mean well. Uh, I think that they're really interested in having that customer list, and this is just an excuse. Do you think drone, VPN, and mailing address hosting will become a thing? <laughs> I think that uh, open source drones are probably about to get real big. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, these are pricey too. Uh, fifteen hundred euros for one of these things, or fifteen hundred pounds. I think they're and coming out with a new version that's only like four or five hundred. That's a lot smaller um, and still has a camera. So maybe maybe they're trying to avoid being sued, or maybe they're trying to avoid you know. Maybe some people are using these type of weapons for, you know, improvised explosive devices. I don't know. But it just doesn't seem like this is a solution. Anytime a company tries to, you know, go over the top policing their own products, I just, I don't think that's a wise move. Yeah. It's got, hopefully it'll hurt sales. That's lesson of the day. Don't buy their crap. Don't, <laughs> don't put up with it. Somebody, if you don't buy their crap, they'll go away and a competitor will show up and they won't do that because they'll learn their lesson. You guys remember the net neutrality story from last week, FCC, Ajit Pai, that kind of thing? There have been some new developments with that. Uh, the FCC has said they're not going to publish evidence of the DDoS attack amid the net neutrality battle. <laughs> it totally happened. It's real, we promise, but we're not going to show any proof of that because reasons. Um, can't we get that from like a FOIA request? I mean... You probably could, but how long does that take? Like six months? I mean, still, though, it would be. It's like, give me the server logs, give me the other stuff. That's not classified. The public has a reasonable interest on that. Come on. Uh, maybe. Uh, I think the, the damage will be done by then, but it will be nice to see. Could it be that there's another reason, maybe? <laughs> Comcast is trying to censor pro-net neutrality website calling for investigations of fake FCC comments, blah, blah, blah. So this is a little sensationalist, like the other headline. Um, Comcast has a problem with the name, they say. Um, Comcastro turf. So yeah. AstroTurf, but with Comcast, see what they did there? And they're like, no, we, that's disparaging. We don't want that. Now, the purpose of this website is not, I don't see any defamation here. I mean, I understand they're using the word Comcast in the name, but the purpose of this website is for you to go on the website, put in your information, and find out if your name was spoofed on the FCC complaint to be pro or anti net neutrality. Yeah. Now, so that, that seems like a. Yeah, that's a valid service, right? Now, if you're totally out of the loop, what happened here was it was here in the States, we're doing some dumb stuff again. So they threw up this thing for public comment. So the public can comment on, it was basically, it's like, should ISPs be able to do whatever they damn well please with your internet connection? You can't say anything about it, yes or no. And um, then the FCC said there was a denial of service attack and people were attacking it and the, the bots were doing bad things. But it looks like there may have been a bot submitting 
pro uh, things in favor of taking away the regulation that protects you know the neutrality of the network basically it, in alphabetical order by name in alphabetical order by name and an awful lot of those people seem to be self-identifying at least the people that have come forward and found their name as subscribers for ISPs so it's like was an ISP database stolen and this is being used by an astroturf company is it Comcast themselves is it a lobby that's being paid for that is unclear at this time but the website is able to pull all of the comments from the FCC's API, and you can search your own name and find it. So that's what's going on with that. It's just, it's sort of a convoluted story, but it's really interesting. And several people have found their own names there, and they have come forward and said, no, I did not say anything like this. Someone has stolen my data. Now, there is another subset of people <laughs> that have been found in this list, and they are very surprising. Yeah. Dead people. Dead people are posting anti-net neutrality comments to the FCC website. This is the zombie apocalypse. This is how it starts. First, they start posting, they shit post, and then they come for our brains. So, just, you know, let, let's go real meta here for a second. What does it tell you about these changes that there's a corporate interest here that's so strong that they're reanimating the dead <laughs> and also opting you in if you just happen to be a customer? It's like... Bob did some business with us five years ago. Let, he, he, yeah, he would. Let's submit a comment for this. That's well. That's bad. You're making an assumption. All right. They might not be reanimating the dead. They might be using, like, uh, you know, astral projection or something <laughs> like that. You know, some sort of. They might just be communing with the dead, and using that, as sort of a, you know, a, a, someone's typing for the dead. Well, you know, it really explains a lot of things. I mean, if Doctor Strange is the one that's in charge of Comcast tech support, that really <laughs> explains a lot. But he's supposed to be a good guy. <laughs> Times are hard. He's got to take what work he can get. Uh, well, in other news of people behaving badly, uh, how would you like to get a voicemail on your phone that never actually rang your phone? Is that less invasive than getting a call at all hours of the day or night from a corporation that you don't want to talk to anyway? Well, I, I think the key part of that sentence is you, dev you didn't want to talk to them anyway. You don't want to hear from them. <laughs> now, again, this is Recode. Little disclaimer, this says Republicans want to do this. Now, <laughs> Everyone wants to yeah, do this. We get, it doesn't matter. Like We've never expressed any sort of political views on this show. Maybe like a, a little bit, but we def red versus blue, we don't touch it. But somebody will always like, you know, project onto us. It's like, <laughs> I can't believe they're Trump supporters. Like, what, really? <laughs> Trump supporters? Both sides of the aisle want this. Yes. Everybody loves to call you and advertise political shit. And so don't don't think that it's just Republicans want to do this. All politicians want this. Yeah, that's the headline at Recode. Uh, they're, they're literally, the group here is asking the FCC to clarify that it is okay to call people as long as they're not actually calling people, they're just leaving them a message on the voicemail because technically that's not calling somebody and it should be allowed to leave them a voicemail without ever having actually rung their phone. Now, this is because on mobile devices, it is not legal to make those calls. Uh, they claim that making these calls is protected political speech. <laughs> it's campaigning. But on mobile devices, it's been ruled that, you know, you can't because mobile calls can cost money. Yeah. Well, they do cost money. So there's rules that you can't do that. On a landline, do whatever you want. But, hey... Nobody has one of those anymore. So the politicians are like, oh, man, we got to figure something out. So the, what they figured out is, let us go directly to voicemail. This will open the floodgates for all kinds of unsolicited commercial voicemail in general. And you also have to think about filling up your voicemail mailbox, right? What happens if you miss important messages because you have 20 different political campaign and carpet cleaning voicemails <laughs> that you never wanted in the first place? I, I think that's going to be a mess if it happens. Well, what we need to police the voicemail are robots. <laughs> <laughs> this is hilarious. Look how look how cute that. Ro I mean, he's it's kind of like a little uncanny valley hideous, <laughs> but, but also kind of adorable. I need that on a t-shirt. <laughs> uncanny valley hideous. <laughs> so in Dubai, robot cops. Now, if you're thinking like you know RoboCop and he's gonna shoot people and stuff like that and it's gonna be fun, nah, they're not. <laughs> fun. They're they're not gonna give him a gun or. Even a baton. He can't even beat people down. What he's going to do is just wander around in crowds and basically spy on everybody. <laughs> so it's basically just surveillance. 
Uh, you can also ask him questions. He can give you directions. He's got that little touch screen on his chest. You can pay fines if you've been fined oh, for yeah. loitering or whatever. I wonder if he sees you littering. Do you think? Because I think there's a human being watching his feed at all times. So he could probably issue you a ticket and then take the payment immediately. <laughs> So how much? Is it going to be like a video game? There's going to be an operator in a room. Yeah. And it's like you're playing Grand Theft Auto, but instead of like stealing cars and stuff, you're patrolling the <laughs> beach. And it's like, oh, you get fined. <laughs> the most boring game of Grand Theft Auto that's ever been conceived. <laughs> uh, well, we always mention AI. It would, it would not be the news if we're not mentioning AI. But this is a sort of a story that AI is only tangentially involved in. Well, the first part of the story is another win for the robots. The game Go, if you're not familiar with the game Go, it's huge in China, and it's a very simple game to play, but almost has chess level in terms of mastery. And complexity. Like the guys that are the best at Go in China are like huge celebrities, household names. And they're very proud of that. China is very proud of their Go players because they're the best in the world. Yeah. You know, just like Koreans in StarCraft, China's got Go. <laughs> but Google's Go robot has beaten the very best. Yes, and that's not really the story. The story is that China ordered all of that news censored because they weren't sure how the, the country would react to that. <laughs> so they sent a memo to all their news outlets and things that said, no live coverage, no tweets, no social media coverage, nothing. Do not mention the AI, do not mention AlphaGo, don't mention Google, none of that. So it would be curious to hear if anybody in the audience is, is you know, in Beijing or, or somewhere in China and it's like, you know, what, are you in the know? Did you see this? Was there a media blackout? Is this overstated? What's going on? Because I think the bigger story is the media blackout versus everything else. Yeah, definitely. I, it, it would be interesting to see from, if we have any Chinese viewers, before this, did you know? And after this, will we be firewalled in China? Also in the news again this week, Bitcoin. After reaching, like, what was it, like 2700 2750 depends on the exchange. I think it peaked at uh, 2700 came down sharply, and uh, this is, again, this is going to betray the fact that we're filming this a little early this week, because when uh -huh. I was leaving, it's actually Friday. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's uh, 2300 and the 2300 is right now, uh, or maybe 2500 I think it's been bouncing around, so it came back from the low and made it back to, like, 25 and now it's at 23 but very volatile, and uh, you know the question is: Was this a was this a top, <laughs> or is this just uh, you know growing pains? <laughs> Good lord, this is crazy! But also not just Bitcoin; a lot of other coins are taking off as well. Uh, you know, you've got Ethereum, which is no you know another cryptocurrency and all this all this sort of fun stuff. So Bitcoin's back in the news. Bitcoin is taking off. Bitcoin is kind of insane. It'll it'll probably crash again. But then it will probably recover a lot more quickly than it did last time. It took, what, almost like a year for it to recover last time? Well, the difference here is, though, there's no, I mean, you had hacking and people lost a lot of money. And this time around, that's not the case. Uh, most financial people, people in the, Bitcoin, in the know about Bitcoin, are still attributing this to Asia. Huge Asian demand for Bitcoin. And you got to assume a lot of that is China, where the Chinese capital controls are still in effect. And the Chinese want to get their money out of the country, and they're stopped from doing that. So Bitcoin starts to look really good. <laughs> oh, our next story is so much fun. If you follow me on Twitter, I kind of tweeted about this a little bit. But there's a security researcher that has been working on Windows 10 Enterprise. This is important because it's the business version of Windows 10 and the group policies. Now, group policy is how businesses control settings on Windows machines across their enterprise. There is settings in Windows 10 Enterprise for controlling all of the telemetry and the Windows Store and Windows Store applications. Like anything that you might want to control as an enterprise, there are settings for it in group policy. Uh, this security researcher found a lot of really interesting things when he started digging around Windows 10 Enterprise and how it responds, or in this case doesn't, to those group, uh, group policy settings. Pretty much every kind of telemetry now, of course, well, we've done a million stories about the Windows telemetry. It tracks everything. It's constantly calling home, even some advertising services. And you, group policy has specific settings for turning that off. It's literally like, do you want to stop this from calling home? Yes, stop this across my entire enterprise. Well, he figured out that it's not respecting any of those settings. Mm -mm. It even goes down to 3D paint. 3D paint, so... As an enterprise, 3D Paint, maybe your employees are using it to doodle it. They're wasting time. You've got to get rid of that. No. Comes w back. Windows will go back, <laughs> reinstall it, and 
green light it on the firewall so that it can continue to call home. I really thought this was sensationalist, so I really dug into it. It's not as sensationalist as it sounds. It really is completely insane. It's so insane that he is right at, like, you disable IPv6, you know, it's the next generation internet protocol. Uh, even when you disable IPv6, the Windows system services are still using the IPv6 stack to attempt to communicate with whatever the telemetry services are. The only thing that you actually can disable is security updates. <laughs> the telemetry and everything else, <laughs> you can't. And that, the, he was going for the opposite situation. He's like, I still want security updates, but I want to disable the telemetry. But it's getting to be more and more the case that the same uh, IP blocks that service uh, your security updates are the same ones that service the telemetry and the ads and that kind of thing. So if you want security updates and you can't not take security updates in this day and age, then you have to put up with the telemetry. And this is an unacceptable position for Microsoft customers to be in. Microsoft has actually responded to this, but incredibly their response was basically stop meddling in group policy. That, <laughs> that's literally their line on this. It's like, yeah, okay, we're doing it and you should quit messing around with it. <laughs> wow. Okay, so those things are there. So somebody, some drone in an office somewhere can tick a box and like some PCI audit compliance check box is like, <laughs> Well, I disabled in group policy. Here's the checkbox. Good luck. Yeah, yeah, but in reality, it's not doing that. And if you get audited, you're not doing that. So that's going to be real bad for you. Well, there is one version of Windows 10 that you can get <laughs> that doesn't one. do that. And that's the China <laughs> government edition of Windows. Wait, what? The Chinese, the Chinese version of Windows? We've I talked about the Chinese government of Windows before, but this week they actually unveiled it. They had a, a press thing in China. And, uh, yeah, they rolled it out. And it's some really flowery language to basically say, this version isn't going to spy on the Chinese. Hey, <laughs> the Chinese government, we're turning all that crap off. You know that stuff that we don't let you turn off? It's gone. We are not. We don't have it in here because the Chinese won't accept it. It seems like the, you know, there would be an antitrust investigation. Perhaps the EU can save us. Somebody in the EU, like, deal with this because the EU is, is the only people that can deal with this from a, a legal standpoint. They're the only ones, I think, that have the legal framework in place to be able to handle this situation. So please, somebody in the EU, figure this but, out. But what they're gonna do is they're gonna put it with that, uh, ex what was it called, executive control? <laughs> and it's gonna be like, oh, well, yeah, we're gonna solve that problem, but you need to give us back doors into everything. And then somebody in America will be like, we'll take it. <laughs> well, uh, we also wanted to highlight this article from CNBC. This is nothing that we haven't talked about before. Self-driving cars and you know professional drivers could lose up to 25,000 jobs a month. But this is a report from Goldman Sachs, which you know, it drives a lot of the um, financial market for better or worse. Some people would fight me tooth and nail for saying that, but. Uh, last week, was it 6 million jobs? Yeah. Or 60 million? I can't remember, but there was another report from a big media company. It was like, oh my God, robots are going to take jobs. Who knew about this? Who saw this coming? And so this is just another CNBC quoting Goldman Sachs saying, yes, these self-driving trucks are going to destroy the economy. And... That's a lot of jobs per month. These articles are a good read, not for new information about you know uh, self-driving cars and how that's going to affect the economy or anything like that, but the perspective on people that are you know five, ten, twenty-year veterans on these various industries and what their perception of and how viable these types of technologies are. We have a little different perspective because we work with technology and and you know the level of rough edges that we'll put up with on technology is a little different than the level of rough edges that say a company like UPS would put up with. Yeah. But when you start to see these kinds of reports from Goldman Sachs, uh, you know change is coming. And you also, when you see figures like that, when you see that many jobs being replaced, we see it as like, oh my God, jobs are being replaced, this is terrible. But UPS sees it as, look at the savings. <laughs> and so they will be more and more willing to accept those rough edges when it's saving them that much money. <laughs> well, there were some uh, memos that were leaked inside Facebook. They've got another kind of problem with, <laughs> with, uh, with the, the human element, I guess. And that is uh, apparently Facebook is flooded with sextortion and revenge porn. Yeah, that's revenge porn is such a, such a hilarious phrase. <laughs> but this, I don't know who leaked this, but somebody got a hold of an internal document where Facebook was, it's how to deal with this and how often it happens. And apparently it's happening all day, every day. <laughs> There's just constant revenge porn. They're even working on algorithms to try and identify this kind of thing. And there's literally, it, it's, it happens so often that unlike the Facebook employee dashboard, there's like a thumbs up, thumbs down 
sextortion or revenge porn button. It's like it's so it's so it happens so much that you have to simplify the interface to deal with it because there's such volume. Humans are such animals. It's so <laughs> terrible. So you know, this should be obvious, but stop making sex tapes. It's <laughs> it's never gonna work out for you. <laughs> uh, uh, this this is a story that we actually missed from last week because it wasn't covered anywhere. But it's a really sort of important case, and, and a few people wrote in with it, so thank you for that. This is the Ukraine has blocked a popular social media network, which I think is the VK, uh, as part of sanctions on Russia. Uh, this was not a legal ruling or anything like that. This was just a politician asking that a social network be blocked, and the Ukrainian ISPs complied, which is a disturbing precedent. They also put limitations on the Kapersky antivirus software. Again, because it's Russian, and they don't want, it, they don't want that in their country. I, I'm not sure. Uh, this is a dangerous precedent just in terms of policy um, for other countries. It's like, this is sort, certainly against the spirit of the internet, but you know how, how easy would it be for a head of state to label uh, you know, a company or to label you know, something from another country as being against the state ideology or whatever, and getting that banned if people believe enough in the leader? That's probably bad. So you mean like if, a, if something in the government happened and it was embarrassing or they didn't have a way to explain it, and they just always parroted the same, it's the Russians phrase? You yeah. Think, you think that would be bad for a country? That would probably uh, be bad for a country. Yeah, it mm. seems like it would be. But it is the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the Russians. It was the Russians stealing the money with the Android app. So <laughs> that's, it's t and that, maybe that was just the exception that proves the rule. I don't know. Uh, let's switch gears for a second. The Agiza 1006 update is kind of out. I think the only the Asus Crosshair Hero 6 uh, has the update as of the time of this video, but early June, most other motherboards will be getting this. This is a big deal for the AMD Ryzen platform because it enables full functionality of everything to do with uh, the you know DDR4 standard. Uh, it, it turns out that XMP is not really super well standardized or, or as documented uh, as you would believe looking at the specifications. So AMD has done a crazy amount of work on DDR4 compatibility, and with this update, it will enable um, a whole bunch more memory kits to work well with Ryzen. It also enables uh, new memory multipliers and things like that. Rumor has it the ACS patch, uh, or the ACS, the uh, Access Control Systems for PCI Express, which is the thing that I was after, which would let you use PCI Express virtualization so you could run a, a Windows gaming VM with a separate graphics card under Linux, which a lot of you were looking for. That works, apparently. I have not tested it myself. Um, there's, there's somebody I know that has a Crosshair Hero 6, and they're working on testing it for me right now. I'm working on getting my hands on a Crosshair Hero 6 so I can test too. But I think with the Agizo 1006 update, that we'll see widespread compatibility across a whole bunch of motherboards, not just the RAM compatibility. So this is super exciting. I can't tell you how excited I am. Probably partying it down right now in Taipei as a result of that. Woo. It's that high enthusiasm thing. It's uh, good. So, yeah. Huh. <laughs> I don't know. Amazon's free banana stands are disrupting the local fruit economy. What, <laughs> what a headline. I was not aware of the Amazon free banana stands, but on the Amazon campus and in the nearby city where they are, they have stands that will just give you bananas. There's always money in the banana stand? <laughs> well, there's no money in this one. There's no money changing hands. Just free bananas. But it turns out, surprisingly, this has tanked the banana market. <laughs> no one else is buying bananas. Like, there's, the store owners are talking about how, like, the people will come in for lunch just with bananas. And they won't order dessert because they've got bananas. <laughs> or, like, they'll come in in the morning and buy, like, oatmeal, and they have bananas. So it's it, the Russians with their communism. <laughs> well, it's, it's Jeff Bezos <laughs> and his bananas. So if something as tiny as giving away free bananas can have that kind of impact on a local economy, what do you think the universal income is going to do? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of things that tank things, World of Tanks uh, doesn't know about the Streisand effect and, and has uh, taken down a negative review using a DMCA strike. Now, this is actually a lot to read and get into. There's, there's a little bit of subtlety here. Well, luckily I, read the, I watched the Jim Sterling video on this, so <laughs> I, I know all the details. Here's, here's the first thing that you got to know about this story. This is a premium tank, meaning it's a free-to-play game, but you buy this tank, right? Did you know that World of Tanks has premium ammo? Huh. 
you buy the ammo and then every time you click you spend money <laughs> huh so the accusation here was from a youtuber who is part of the world of tanks internal community he's like one of their representatives or whatever he was very angry about this tank because the tank can it's pretty much invulnerable to anything but that premium ammo so you buy the tank and then only people who spend the money on the ammo can hurt the tank hmm. and he was very angry about this so the wargaming company immediately issued a copyright takedown huh. copyright hmm. that doesn't seem like a copyright offense that doesn't seem like a copyright offense at all so here we are with the strike sand effect letting you know so you can look into it for yourself because well, otherwise you guys probably wouldn't have known well it's <laughs> it worked <laughs> people went crazy over this and what well, they've apologized <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if they reinstated him i don't know if he's interested in being reinstated but they definitely put up the white flag on this one as they should have so <laughs> just keep in mind when things like this happen torches and pitchforks sometimes do work <laughs> it only took an unruly internet mod <laughs> <laughs> error of your way. although you still can buy the tank and you still have to pay for the ammo so. <laughs> has anything really changed i guess they're still the winner free publicity if nothing else well the xbox game subscription service which has been in the rumor mill since the xbox was a thing is going live june 1. This is sort of like a Netflix for Xbox. You don't own any of these games. You just have an unlimited license to play them for that month, and then every month or every so often, they'll rotate the games. So for 10 bucks a month, eh, probably not a terrible deal. Yeah, we're not console gamers, but it's really hard to find something wrong with this. Um, give it a try and let us know. Let us know what your thoughts are on this if you are a console gamer and you're looking into this kind of a service if it, is it a good value add is it too much for the money i mean what is it i think uh the only thing about this is you think about netflix and how disruptive that was because it gave you something that the other services weren't going to give you i don't think this is ever going to give you that because it's still microsoft they still want to sell their triple a games they still want to do all that so uh you're probably not going to get the latest and greatest on this maybe one of them per month or whatever but still 10 bucks a month and a lot of games, you know, if you got nothing else to do, that's a pretty good value. Yeah. I'm thinking about like used games in the used game market. And it's like, I could get 12 games a year on an average yeah. of $10 each. But, you know, the selection there at $10 each is really not a lot. So it's really going to depend on what's in the subscription library. I don't know. I, I am not a console pleb, of course. <laughs> I have no idea. One other theme on stories. We may not have had many stories in this theme but it's the stories that bring us closer to being in the matrix. And this mm. one definitely squarely fits. It's like turning human <laughs> beings into batteries. Now, there is a problem here. Because, of course, you know... In Just the, one? Well, <laughs> but I'm saying there's a problem with moving into the matrix. <laughs> because this battery requires you to move around a bunch. Mm. And it requires fluids to be moving through your body. So you're not going to be locked into a little pod with them harvesting your electricity. You will be in a labor camp where they harvest your electricity. It's a big difference. <laughs> oh, this, this technology uh, apparently also requires graphene, which is an insanely thin layer of carbon. Um, sometimes when you're trying to make carbon nanotubes, you get graphene. And they're like, oh, it's totally non-toxic. You can have a battery that totally doesn't use toxic metals. And it's like, you know what else doesn't use toxic metals? Asbestos. Asbestos <laughs> doesn't use toxic metals. Well, the, the carbon nanotubes individually in your blood are real bad right <laughs> yeah so if it were to break for whatever reason <laughs> but this is actually not a battery it's a super capacitor which is better and uh as you move around somehow it uses uh, urine is one of the things it uses like where <laughs> are they injecting this in your body that it's getting to urine but as you move around and fluid moves through your body this thing will actually charge itself up and is a capacitor so it can discharge very quickly they're thinking that things like pacemakers could move to this so you never have to have a battery change. That would be pretty cool as yeah. long as it's, it's uh, like the device needs the ability to recognize that its host is dying and is not like <laughs> usurping energy from it. Because it's going to be like, ooh, I'm getting kind of lightheaded. And it's like, oh, I'm low on energy. Let me just take even more energy from your bloodstream or whatever. Yeah. And uh, I think it is pretty useless once you are sedentary. So <laughs> if you're, you know, lying in a hospital bed for a long period of time, you might not get the power you need. So... <laughs> I don't know what you do in that situation. So when the machines do take over, I'm going to be counting on Boeing's new hypersonic space plane to get <laughs> me to safety. <laughs> this plane is really cool because it's actually uh, it's a two-stage thing. This thing, it's, so the idea is satellites. 
We want to get satellites up there, right? We want to do it for cheap. So this guy takes off vertically, goes up to a certain height, launches another mini rocket from itself, which launches the satellite, and then lands like a regular plane. Fuel it back up and it can do it over and over. That's the plan at least. And they're thinking five million a trip, wow. which is really cheap. Yeah, this is really important for um, if we ever go to war or there's ever a solar flare that's really bad, we're going to need to get a lot of satellites back in orbit really quickly. Yeah. And we cannot do that right now. It's very bad from an infrastructure standpoint because we really depend on satellite communication and we just don't have an easy way to launch a ton of satellites. But this thing, if it becomes a reality, we'll definitely be able to do that. I mean, you're talking about, I mean, five million, that's a lot of money, sure. But when we're talking about defense budget, five million, they could run that thing around the clock <laughs> and, you know, not even run the deficit up that much per year. You know, just get rid of one or two of these what's the f32 f35 program <laughs> cut that back a little bit and launch like 20 satellites a year <laughs> we can solve all of the gps satellite problems i mean there's just there there are there's a whole branch of computer scientists and really smart people out there working on making satellites that were never designed to do really sophisticated things do really sophisticated things with the most unbelievable software hacks you can imagine and being able to just say oh yeah that that satellite's running a 486 let's just you know, deorbit that into the Pacific Ocean and launch another satellite, that would be great. Disposable satellites is actually a good thing for society. Yeah. And there'll be a lot more, uh, you know, private use, a lot more media delivery type things, stuff like that. So uh, assuming that they let the private sector use this, I can't imagine why they wouldn't. I mean, <laughs> hey, give us $10 million and it costs five. We'll put something up there for you. $10 million. Mm, probably probably five to ten years probably i'd say maybe i don't know by that time we should be ready to launch our level one satellite <laughs> probably could launch a pico satellite right now if it's like a one inch cube it wouldn't be terribly expensive mm. well we can use gene editing to also make the perfect tomato because we've gotten that good with gene splicing apparently this is good old crisper again <laughs> which is hilarious because it's crisper that's where you put your tomatoes in the refrigerator you put them in the crisper <laughs> dad jokes but i'm <laughs> <laughs> so this is not really radical gene editing what they're doing is it turns out so when we talk about genetically modified stuff uh it's important to note that ever since mendel we've been genetically modified look at the dogs we have yeah. look at these little rat dogs what, how do you think they got like that? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a radioactive accident. We've been gene editing. We've done the same thing with plants. I like to imagine the Chihuahua as a radioactive uh, accident. <laughs> it might be. <laughs> All those nuclear plants in Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> so we've been mixing these tomatoes to get better tomatoes. One of the problems we had is like the really nice, big, juicy tomatoes. They don't grow as many tomatoes on the vine because they're huge and the vine can't support them. So the plant's like... I must adapt. Well, with CRISPR, forget it. You can, <laughs> you can just make them have giant tomatoes, not as many flowers, not as many leaves, not as many joints. Joints are a big thing for tomatoes, I guess. And so just through very small changes, getting a much higher yield out of these big, giant, genetically modified mutant tomatoes. Neat. So that's good. This kind of thing actually is probably really important and not, not actually terrible for society because we will need to dramatically increase the efficiency of food production in order to sustain the growing population of Earth. So eh, we might accidentally create the zombie apocalypse, but you know, honestly, this thing with, with tomatoes and I would say probably also saving the modern banana because the modern banana doesn't have enough genetic diversity and a fungus is gonna wipe it out everywhere. CRISPR really is probably its only hope of being saved. The, uh, Amazon should support the banana thing. I mean, because they got the free bananas, right? <laughs> Maybe that's why it's like they're they're taking the money that they're depressing out of the local economies with the free bananas to fund CRISPR research on the banana fungus thing. And then they've cornered the banana market, and they take away the free ones, jack up the price, right? Oh, uh, Jeff Bezos, it's... he is Putin's brother by another mother. <laughs> it's the long game. <laughs> Well, we've come to the end of another episode of Level 1 Text. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to check out our Computex coverage because that's going to be really awesome. Thanks again to MSI and Fractal for sponsoring the trip. Um, I guess we will... Uh, Krista, I, I won't see you on yeah. Tuesday. I'm just going to be on Twitter. Uh, so you can look forward to a Krista and Ryan yep. episode of the news. Those big Krista fans, be sure to tune in next week. We'll see you.